last year I posted this video on how I started my pet transportation business and ever since then you guys have blown up my emails and my DMs on Instagram and um, wow. So now a year and some months later, I thought I'd circle back and just tell you like all the things that have changed in my business since I made that video for good and bad, how I am adjusting to the market and also just telling you a little bit more about how my ground transport business has morphed into the flight nanny world. And I know that that's where you have all of your questions. So I've got a list right here um, of all of your biggest questions about what it's like to be a flight nanny and maybe how you might get started in this business as a flight nanny if you are so interested in doing so. So let's go. First big piece of news is that I have switched coasts. So I am no longer in Southern California. I am now in Connecticut. And I don't know how long I'll be here, you know, a year or so. It's good for the moment, but it's definitely a big change. The good news is that a business like this, when you're in transportation, that your home base doesn't matter too much. I don't feel like my clients have changed a whole lot. Now it's just about rolling in a little bit of a new market. A lot of my ground transport jobs are usually coast to coast anyway, so now, you know, I'm just on the other side. Uh, one thing that I have found actually really helpful is that I still sort of have a, a base in Southern California. I have a storage unit there that is filled with a bunch of pet supplies and it's right by the John Wayne Airport and so, I use that as a pivot point a lot of times whenever I'm flying or driving. It's just really nice to kind of have a space there with some supplies so that I don't have to fly with everything that I need. So it's not ideal, but it's not too bad, you know, and I also have my mailbox there, all of that sort of thing. So business is still technically set up in California and I still have a lot of regular clients who are based there. So I am currently packing for my next seven day trip. Uh, I am going to be doing half the time flying and half the time on ground. So I've got my backpack and my suitcase, my carry on here that I'm kind of filling up with supplies at the moment. So I'll be doing that as we talk a little bit. We'll see how far I get. Yeah. Okay. So your number one question about me, about uh, this industry is how did you get started as a flight nanny? And so the truth is that it just sort of happened. It just sort of morphed out of doing local ground transportation. And once I did my first flight, everything just kind of clicked and I had an aha moment and I just realized like how meant for this I was. It was a combination of pets, travel, logistics, things that, you know, I've always, I've always been passionate about or had skills in, but just didn't realize how they could all come together and be monetized. Before I was a pet transporter, I was in the theater industry, like completely <laughs> different field. I had studied for a long time to be an actress, did some independent film festivals while I was in college. And so I've always been sort of a creative spirit and also just non-traditional, you know, the, the nine to five just never really fit for me. And I had to learn some of that a little bit the hard way, but I've always been a creative soul. And so the fact that now I'm in this industry, it's really interesting to see how I can infuse my creativity into what I do. I think a lot of that is why I'm on YouTube, you know, because I love storytelling and um, I do have some experience being in front of the camera and I miss that, you know? And so finding a way to tell my story, to share what I do and, creatively craft that story through visual media, uh, it's really fun. Sharing these little furry animals and uh, what your life maybe looks like on the inside, it's just fun. So yeah, theater industry. And you know, I did, I did internships, you know, in many different places. I grew up in Texas and the Dallas area. And once I was done with high school, um, I just got some internships in various places. I, I spent my summers in Colorado. I lived in Greensboro, North Carolina, and then finally I decided that I was going to go to grad school in Minneapolis. And after three years of doing internships, you know, the, the jobs that I kept getting were in costume design, you know, working at festivals like Shakespeare festivals and summer festivals um, as a wardrobe assistant or as a stitcher. And, and I just kept getting jobs like that until, you know, three years later you realize, okay, I. I guess I'm a costumer. <laughs> so I wanted more education in that formally. And so 
I ended up applying to grad school and landed in Minneapolis and I was there for four years studying costume design and technology and um, after that again you know just trying out some freelance work and then I landed back again in Cincinnati at the Cincinnati Shakespeare Festival where I worked on and off for them for 10 years. First as an intern for two years uh, and then I came back and I was full-time as a resident costume designer and you know it's one of those jobs that you get where you think this is it like this is this is what I've been working towards you know my whole career and to, to get a residency somewhere to to be doing what you love and you're passionate about full-time like psh, like it was amazing until it wasn't you know and I think that's a really that's something they don't tell young people about you know about reaching their dreams is that sometimes you get there and it's not what you thought it was going to be how many pee pads do I need for three puppies I think I need a lot so yeah you know it it was a little bit heartbreaking because I really just sabotaged myself honestly which is unhappy and I think because creatively I was really satisfied but even though it was in a creative field it was still a nine to five structure and I had to work other jobs just to make ends meet my nine to five job was as a costume designer but I was also working Starbucks in the mornings most days from like 4 to 8 a.m. And then oftentimes at night, I'd either be sketching out my new design, shopping for fabrics, doing research for the next project that wasn't currently on board, um, or I was delivering groceries, you know? And so do that for three years and, you know, suddenly the dream doesn't look so dreamy anymore. And I was unhappy and I made everyone else around me really unhappy too. And so, yeah, I, I left that full-time nine to five job and just started freelancing on the side. And that was actually fun, just being able to travel and, you know, just freelance as a costume designer. It really got me to, to travel some, to some new places and, and stretch some new skills. You know, I had worked at a Shakespeare company for so long that, I really forgot how much I enjoyed, you know, doing musicals and things like that. And so just stretching some of those muscles again. Um, but again, it was hard. <laughs> and you know, I had my apartment set up as an Airbnb while I was traveling. So that could make me a little bit of income while I was away. And I was still doing grocery delivery. And then 2020 happened. And suddenly theaters were shutting down. I ended up going back to Cincinnati to my apartment and canceled all of my Airbnb bookings and wasn't sure what was next. Uh, I was lucky that I had some savings, you know, that I had just finished two or three really big projects and so I had comfortable, I guess you could say, like two or three months of income, um, you know, to pay rent and to, to eat and things like that. But after that, I didn't know what was next. I think none of us really knew what was happening in that time, you know, when things were shutting down, like, we just kind of hoped uh, that it wouldn't be long term and that we'd all just kind of be going back to our normal day to day routines and finding work. And um, for me, it was a time to really sit with myself, you know, and and reflect and and think, you know, am I happy? Do I want to go back into <laughs> into the fire of this theater world and it's so so hard because when you invest so much time you know in yourself and in growing and in developing developing these skills and your reputation in the industry and all of that and uh and you think about starting over and something else it's it's hard it's really hard to think about doing that but in a way the pandemic sort of forced me to pivot and you know when theater shut down there was no theater work to pursue and so I knew I had to find something else and I didn't know if it was going to be long term or full term or what what was going on but I just knew I had to find something else and I had been doing grocery delivery for so long I didn't I didn't want to do that again I I just wanted to find something else and so you know I was looking at some online administrative work um and I did some, you know, little things through Upwork and things like that just to make ends meet. But it wasn't anything that was, that felt purposeful. It was just, you know, to make money. And so as I was at home scrolling through Facebook, 
one of those days in March or April, uh, I came across this advertisement for Citizen Shipper. And it's sort of a marketplace where people can list their transport needs. And this site had a lot of listings for moving your motorcycle or, or entire household moves or, or things like that. But the, the main thing on the website was pet transport. And I just knew that that was something I would be really good at and that I could do just on a case by case basis, you know? And so I made a membership. I started to get to know the platform a little bit, was starting to have conversations with people. And I thought, okay, if I just find like a 400 mile trip, you know, it's like a day drive for me. Um, you know, it'd be a perfect way to just like try it out, make a little bit of income and then get back home and just see what happens. And after I booked my first trip, uh, then <laughs> I quickly booked my second and third and it just kept going. And as long as it kept going and I was having fun, I just thought, why not? After two or three deliveries, I got onto the, the Facebook group for citizen shipper drivers and just started searching, you know, for all the answers about how to do this long term. How should I be pricing my services? Um, do I need certain paperwork? What are the legal requirements to do this full time? Do I need a business license? Do I need to make a business at all? I mean, there are just so many questions. and. I think when when you're starting a business in general, you know, just having a sounding board of other people who've done this before is really helpful. And so that community was definitely, definitely helpful to answer some of those basic questions. And once I had those under my belt, I spent that summer just doing a lot of research. And then by the fall, I decided to create Purple Pup, which would be my business. And since then I have just continue to do the same thing of research and experiment and growing and just seeing where this business takes me. And my first flight nanny trip, um, it was with a breeder that I had been working with before and um, they had a flight nanny booked with one of their puppies, but she got sick and she couldn't fly and, and this family was desperate to get their puppy right away and so she called me and she goes, she said, I know you normally just do ground transport, but would you willing, be willing to do a flight? And of course, you know, I'm down. Um, let me just like research the airline policies to see what I need to know. And uh, I found a flight on Southwest. You know, I went to the Southwest Airlines pet policy and I, I looked up everything I needed to know there. And the airlines are really good about explaining to you what you need. And I said, yeah, I can get this puppy on a flight tomorrow. You know, here's how much it would cost your customer for, you know, for me to fly from Cleveland to uh, Phoenix. And the customers were ecstatic, you know? And so the next day I was on this flight with this adorable little puppy. Um, of course there were, I had a lot of questions, but I knew if I jumped in, I would figure it out. I mean, people fly with their own pets all the time, right? You know, so there's all kinds of forums. When you do a Google search, you know, a lot of people have are doing the same thing every single day. And I, and the only difference is that uh, I'm monetizing it, right? So um, I had the health papers, I was able to get a pet carrier, I took my flight to Phoenix, and then a couple hours later, turned around and, and flew back to Cleveland, and that was it. But once you do it that first time, you realize like, okay, okay, I, I get it. I, I, I get how this works. And so from then on, I had the confidence to sort of market that as a service option, whether it's ground or flight, you out a way to solve the problem that people need in the pet transportation industry, which is getting their pet from one place to another quickly and safely. And so from there, I just sought out more and more opportunities. All right, next question you had for me is, how many flights do you do in a week or how many flights are considered full-time in this industry? And yeah, so it varies quite a bit because I do ground transport as well. But I would say in general, if you're doing three or four flights, three or four puppy deliveries per week, I would consider that full-time. You know, a lot of times getting to the pickup can take an entire day and then making that delivery can take an entire day. So even though it's only one delivery, sometimes it takes two days to get there and get back um, and get home, you know, because not every pickup or delivery is at your home base. So sometimes, 
you know, you're flying to Dallas, delivering to Chicago, and then flying back home. So it's three flights, and sometimes that can take two days, even though we try to kind of do it all in one day so that you're at home and not having to get a hotel and that sort of thing. In general, three domestic flights per week is average. And sometimes I'm able to create a route so that I, I am picking up and delivering and not, not having any empty flights. And that, that's really hard to do in the beginning. It kind of takes a certain volume of, of customers coming your way. But once you have that, then you can sort of negotiate and say, hey, look, I would love to get your puppy home this weekend, but if you can wait for the following week, I'll be in Boston um, where your puppy needs to be picked up and I can offer you a really great rate. And so a lot of times that's how my schedule works out where I will have, you know, four or five puppies scheduled throughout a month and then other customers were just sort of filter in in between and I try to create a three or four day route so that instead of flying back home, you know, I'm hopping airport to airport and using my time um, efficiently and, and being able to offer my customers the very best price. And this sort of ties into the next question, which is, do you, do you use flight benefits? And for those of you who don't know what that means, um, if you work for an airline or maybe you have a family member who works for an airline, then you get to fly for free. And so a lot of people in the pet flight nanny industry are using flight benefits. And so they can fly standby, which means they don't pay for their ticket. They maybe pay for taxes, um, but they don't have a confirmed seat on a flight. And so they're waiting for that flight to, to have an open seat to fly with a puppy. And as you can imagine, if you're not paying for airfare, you can make significant profit, you know, off of this. I'm not using benefits. I do not work for an airline. I do not have family members that work for an airline. So I am paying for my flights and I charge my customers a total that includes all of my expenses and my time. And the reason that's so important to me is because I value the pets and I value a customer's time. When you fly on standby, there are just so many risks involved and we can go into that at a different time, but nope, I don't use benefits. I don't believe in using benefits for this type of work. So that's why my strategy to success has been a little bit different than maybe some other people. Okay, next question. What has been your favorite flight nanny destination? Oh, good one. So last summer I got to go to Lisbon, Portugal for the first time and it just, it blew me away and I was lucky I got to stay for a few days as a tourist and uh, I spent three or four days in Lisbon and then three or four days in Porto as well. Yeah, one of my favorites by far. All right, next question. What are some of your favorite items for new people who are starting this business? Yeah, of course, you know, I think you've heard me talk about the Sherpa Deluxe Pet Carrier, which is one of my favorites and it, it works on every single flight every single pet that I travel with. So it's definitely one of my go-tos that I rely on. I would say anyone who's getting started, you know, having a simple pet carrier like this one, having um, some sort of water dish, which you can use these little pop-up ones, or you can use like a stainless steel one like this, and potty pads, you know, take four with you for one puppy for a trip, and a little flannel blanket. Those are kind of the essentials that you need for your first flight and um, things that I always recommend to people who are just getting started or feeling nervous about their first flight with their own pets. But speaking, um, these are not an item, but it is an app that I love. It's called Flighty. It links to my email. It can track all of my flights automatically when they're booked. And then it sends me updates and, and I can get updates about possible flight delays or cancellations hours before the airlines will send me that information. So when you fly as much as I do, it's definitely worth it to have that kind of information handy. And not only that, but it also tells me details like, you were on the same aircraft last year on April 25th. And I'm like, okay, that's crazy you know that. Um, the main things is you can track, okay, your current aircraft is in Denver. It's delayed 30 minutes, um, but still showing on time, you know, at your pickup location. So anyway, those things can become really helpful when you're strategizing your next move if you are approaching any kind of delay or cancellation. And that ties in perfectly to your next question. Um, do you ever have to deal with canceled flights or significant delays? And if so, like, how do you do that when you have a puppy? Yeah, 
absolutely. It, it happens all the time. And I, honestly, I have been incredibly lucky. You know, the, the problems that I've had are, are usually easy to solve, but you know, it does take a certain personality to be able to adjust to something like that. You know, thinking ahead and strategizing what is the best move to get this puppy home as soon as possible. And, and also financially, you know, what is the smartest move to take here? Over this last year, I have implemented a policy where I include travel insurance in my fee so that I don't have to ask a customer for more money if we do have to change flights or if there's a delay or cancellation while we are in transit. There are just so many other strategies we can get into about, about how to do that. If you are interested in learning more about how my strategy works and how I've learned to monetize this and make it my full-time work, you're welcome to join my Flight Nanny Pro training course and community where I really dive in and just share everything I know um, and teach you how to become uh, your own flight in any business and I'll have a link for that below so you can set up a time to chat with me to see if it's a good fit for you. You know, one trick that I I have used before is if I see there's any chance that my flight's going to get canceled, I automatically just get on Google and I figure out the next available flight and I will just book it right there. Usually if the, the original flight is canceled, then they're going to refund my credit card anyway. And if it's a matter of you know, being delayed or or anything. There's there's ways financially to kind of get around that, but that's also why I just include, you know, my in-house travel insurance so that if there are moments like that, I can respond quickly and not being worried financially about how to make that happen. Sometimes just being quick on your feet and making a decision to move forward is, is the best solution you can have. I have been uh, fortunate, like the, the craziest like delays and cancellation stories I've had have been when I'm empty or when I'm trying to get someplace. And one of my most recent experiences, I was flying to Miami. I was about to take an international flight. And so I wanted to get to Miami, uh, you know, like 12 hours in advance just to be sure that I wasn't gonna have any problems getting on my flight. And so I actually booked two flights. I booked like a, a flight the night before, and then a flight the morning of that would have been nonstop and direct. And I get on this plane in Dallas and I'm supposed to be just going direct to Miami. We're sitting on the plane about to take off and this lady in the back just starts yelling at people and I'm not really sure what's going on. You know, I'm not really paying attention too much. It happens sometimes. Um, but it turns out she is very drunk and belligerent and um, finally she starts hitting people and uh, they try to get her off the plane. She refused to get off the plane. And so we all know what that means is that they're going to deboard all of us until she finally gets off. The police ended up coming and she struck the police as well, which poor lady, like she's going to wake up in the morning and feel like so bad about what she just did, you know, like no fly list for you. Um, <laughs> so that flight did not take off. We had to completely deboard. Um, they gave us a hotel voucher, but the hotel was like 30 minute drive away. And our next flight was going to be in just four hours, you know, five in the morning, six in the morning. And so there wasn't any reason to like go to a hotel. And I finally made it to Miami the next morning, like nine or 10 a.m and was just exhausted. But yeah, you know, it happens sometimes. And I try to be smart and just buffer extra time between flights when possible. Um, or you just have to make a last minute decision and book a new flight and get where you need to go. You know, in the very beginning of my career, I think the biggest mistakes that I made were just booking my customers too close together because we would have problems, you know, if one flight was delayed, it would just domino my entire schedule. You know, I'd have to rearrange all of these flights just to, you know, keep everybody on schedule. And so now I'm not afraid to just budget a little bit of extra time. Um, but also I've just, I, I have grown to understand the flight schedules a little bit better and I know, okay, here's here's option A, I know option B is at this time and option C is at this time. And so it allows me to, um, you know, schedule myself in a way that is um, efficient, but also not detrimental if things do go wrong. All right, next question. Is there a season for this type of work? You know, it's interesting. After, you know, three and a half years of doing this, you do start to see some trends. 
I would say, you know, we, I generally see an uptick in Flight Nanny customers in October because people are trying to book for the holidays, November and December. Um, not always new puppies, just people traveling for the holidays and that sort of thing. I don't like to do puppy deliveries around, you know, Christmas time. I don't really believe in, in pets as gifts and so I tend to avoid that and so there's a little bit of a surge in October and then my biggest surge happens in April actually because everyone is planning for summer moves, you know, summer relocations and things like that. So April is usually a really big um, revenue month that sets me up for the summer and I love it um, because you know typically I'm booked out a month in advance and once I get to April I'm usually booked out May and June as well and that has, that's good and bad, <laughs> but uh, I, I will never be sad about the business that, that wants to come my way during that time. What do you do uh, when a dog pees or poops or cries on a plane? Yeah, you know, it happens. It's like, you know, puppies are like babies. You just clean up after them and then you carry on. It's really not as big of a deal as I think people worry about whenever they think about flying with a pet. You know, I, I definitely have tons of poop stories, you guys. I mean, the, it, if it happens, it happens at the most inconvenient time possible. You know, I, I've had puppies that will usually poop right as I'm going through security, you know, about to take them out of a pet carrier. And I have to apologize to the security, TSA, like, yep, they just pooped in there. I'll just zip this up really nice as it goes through the, the x-ray machine there. You know, the puppy poops right as we are boarding the plane, you know. It happens, it, it happens. And uh, again, there are some strategies to help prepare for that so that it's not a big issue. And one, you know, hint that I offer people, put two potty pads inside of the pet carrier so that when they use one, you just like wrap it up, put it into one of your little plastic doggy bags, and then you have a fresh one already in your pet carrier and ready to go, so. No big deal. But yeah, you know, it happens. Um, you know, with the crying, we really try to do our best to prevent that. And so setting up time in the beginning to make sure that the pet is comfortable in their pet carrier, especially if it's a new puppy going home, we definitely recommend to the breeder, you know, give them five, 10 minutes every day inside of the pet carrier to prepare for this experience. It helps so, so much. Um, one thing that's really helpful too, um, we found if they have like a little snuggle puppy uh, or like a little chew toy, like I love these little Nyla bones because they're indestructible, but they give them something hard to chew on. Those are really, really helpful as well. Soft, comfy blanket, you know, anything just to give them a little bit of comfort is going to help. And sometimes we have to use a little bit of children's Benadryl to just help them go to sleep a little bit um, on a case by case basis. So well, I've been fortunate, like I've, I've never been denied boarding. Um, I'm just gonna knock on a bunch of wood right now about that, but never been denied because of pet carrier size or puppy size or, you know, because the puppy's been distressed or anything like that. But I do have peers who have stories, who have, who've had issues of getting denied boarding for whatever reason. So um, I just really, I, I take care to choose my airline really carefully based on the puppy and their needs and where we're going. Um, and, uh, I think, um, personality has a lot to do with it as well. You know, if you are warm and kind and you don't get stressed out about whatever situation is happening, I don't, I try not to draw a lot of attention to myself, even though, you know, when you're holding a puppy, that's kind of hard to do. Sometimes people want to come over and say hi, but, uh, yeah, it helps. It's being a nice person just can go a long way in this type of field. Another really great question, do you just travel with puppies and kitties coming from breeders? No, and I think I think this is one of the biggest misconceptions about this industry. I just get so many comments from people who say, oh, my ethics wouldn't allow me to do this type of work because I don't wanna work with breeders. And honestly, my, my business is kind of shifting away from from working with with puppies and kittens that are coming from a breeder it's still a big part of it and i definitely love those experiences but you know i'm finding that i can be more helpful to families who are moving and that i've i have become more of um a full service instead of just airport to airport a lot of what i'm doing is helping families with 
you know, two dogs, two small dogs that need to fly, and I fly with the customer and their pets and, and help them move cross country. And so I'm, I'm picking them up from their home. I've arranged all of their flights, you know, and the pet reservations, and we're going to the airport together. I'm helping them with their luggage and then helping them get to their final destination. And I feel like there's so much more to this industry than just puppies and kitties. And so I wouldn't let that scare you away if, if that bothers you. I've worked with a lot of rescues as well. I love when that works out. And you know, military relocations, of course, are, are big as well. And I mean, there are countless reasons why people would need pets to travel. You know, maybe they can't fly themselves or they don't want to fly themselves or they just want someone who has done this before to handle those details. And that's why I'm here. And I love that. And I love that my business keeps evolving into new and exciting things. Okay, I think that's all the questions I have time for today. I have not done a lick of packing here because I got too distracted looking at the camera, but if you have additional questions, I'd love for you to leave those comments below. We'll create a whole nother video just answering those questions. And again, if you're curious about what it's like to be a flight nanny, I encourage you to like and subscribe. All right, that's all for today. Thanks, and the next one will be right here.